I'm Al O'Quinn, the senior pastor here at Bethany Baptist Church. I want to thank you for joining us on our television broadcast today. It's not by chance or accident that you've joined us today. I pray that as you tune in, you will recognize and realize God had you join us today because he has a message just for you. And so I hope that you'll listen intently and you'll be obedient to the prompting of the Holy Spirit as the Lord speaks to your heart today. I want you to know that we want to pray for you and pray for your needs. And so you can call us at 770-957-4455 and leave your prayer request. Answer machine will come on and you'll leave your request. If no one can answer the phone, please leave it on the voicemail. And we will pray for you. We'll return your call if you leave us a number. And be assured that we'll pray, praying for you and all of your needs. So thank you for joining in the broadcast today from Bethany Baptist Church. I hope you'll come and see us real soon. God bless you, and we'll go to the service right now. Glad you're here. And how, didn't the kids do great? Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> wonderful. Well, I hope you mothers will have a wonderful, wonderful Mother's Day. We're glad you're here in the house of the Lord today. I do want to remind you, uh, Chuck mentioned this, that uh, next Sunday we do have a uh, prospective candidate for uh, worship pastor. And uh, you'll learn his name next week. We won't tell you today. Um, we've tried to do this process. The committee has to protect his identity. He's still serving a church. And so we're still mindful of that. So that's why we've not told you his name or anything like that. But he will be with us. Uh, he and his family will be with us next Sunday uh, to lead at 8.30 and 11. So please keep that in prayer, uh, if you would, please. I want to read this morning... Um, from the same text that Barry shared with you just a moment ago, um, Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to begin reading in verse 3, and uh, pray that the Holy Spirit would uh, speak to our heart and lead us and teach us. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with verse 3. Hear therefore, O Israel... And be careful to do them, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Now verse 4 begins a section of scripture called the Shema, which uh, devout Jew would say over and over and over and over to remind himself of his dedication to the Lord. The scripture reads, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way. And when you lie down. And when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. That they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day as we've honored mothers and as we've dedicated babies. And uh, today, Lord, is just a reminder of how very precious and very important family is. And our family is to us and the family is to you. And so I pray today, Lord, as we... Uh, as we gather here, we gather to worship you, the author and the finisher of our faith, and the creator of what we know as marriage, as a family. And it's sacred. And we pray, Lord, that we would always stand to defend the family and uh, the home as created and designed by you. I pray, Lord, today that you would uh, just speak to our heart through this passage. I pray that you might uh, guide us and direct us. I pray the Holy Spirit to teach us and to... Uh, Share with us and then give us enlightenment to the text. We know, Lord, our familiarity with passages sometimes. We think we know what it says. And yet we can read it and under the Im Im impression of the Holy Spirit, we can see a new truth or see a new truth in a more powerful way. So, Lord, we pray that today. We pray that you'd help us. I pray you'd shield me behind the cross. I pray the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we gathered here on Thursday morning and had a wonderful prayer time. And I appreciate you and our church family coming, being a part of our National Day of Prayer. 
And as we gather to pray for our nation, uh, we prayed for our, for our president, we prayed for our local government, we prayed for national government. We were honored to have uh, dignitaries here in our prayer time uh, from the sheriff department, the police department, the mayor. Uh, great representation here as we came to pray. And as we prayed, we prayed for the family, we prayed for America. I think that uh, it's all uh, understood by us as you watch the news, as you read the paper, you recognize that uh, the family is under attack in America. The family as God created it, as God designed it, as God ordained it, is under assault. In the book of Genesis, the Bible says that from the dust of the ground, God created man. And he breathed in his nostrils and he became a living soul. Then he saw that man, Adam, uh, needed a help me. He caused a sleep to fall upon Adam. And from Adam's side, he took a rib. And with that rib, he created woman. And the Bible says that he created woman not to compete with her husband, but to complete her husband, and that the two might be one. And then he gave them a directive. He told them to to multiply and replenish the earth, procreation. And he said, this is the family. One man, one woman. Creating, birthing, and giving birth to children. That's God's design. That's God's plan. Now that design and that plan is under attack. Now there's an alternate plan by some that would be an alternative or something extra besides what God has ordained. And so the biblical family is under attack. And uh, here's what we need to know. When the family begins to disintegrate and fall apart, so goes the culture and so goes society. Because the basic structure of the culture is the family. It's the family. And so when the family begins to fall apart, then there's trouble in culture. And that's why we have trouble in America today. We have problems in America today because of the decline in the family and marriages, uh, in the trouble in homes, and abortion... And all of those things create to the problem we have today in our country. And now there's this idea, well, there's another alternative where it's called same-sex union or same-sex marriage, which God does not say should be marriage and should not be family. That's what God says. Now that will come under attack, and it is under attack. Supreme Court now is trying to make a decision. And we need to be praying about that. We need to be praying about that. Because the decision they make will greatly impact culture, America. And the decision they make will greatly impact the churches in America. It is very possible, should they rule, if they rule in agreement for same-sex union, it's very possible what could come later would be that many, many churches would close their doors. And there's going to be chaos. There's going to be chaos. There's going to be trial. There's going to be testing. It could get very, very ugly. So we need to pray as a people. We need to pray as a church for our nation, for America. We need to pray for the family. But I want to tell you something else that people don't understand. And there are a lot of people who don't agree with the Bible. They don't believe the Bible. They don't believe in God. And you look at our founding fathers and they all have something to say about God and establishing this republic on God and the Judeo-Christian ethic. But when God gave the design for the family... One man, one woman, procreation, multiply the earth. He also gave some other steps of building a strong, happy family. He said you should be equally yoked. Equally yoked. What does that mean? It means that a Christian man marries a Christian woman. And I know many times that uh, I, I, in my counseling I've talked to people and I've, I've encouraged folks and I've taught, talked folks. And uh, you know... S -s -s these women, these girls have a mother's heart. They're females. They have a mother's heart. That, you know, they can take in a stray dog. Well, if they can take in a stray dog, they can take in a, a guy that may not be exactly what he ought to be. Well, I can change him. I, I can change him. Does he know the Lord? Well, I can change him. No, you can't. The only person that can change anybody, you know who that is? It's God. Ruth Graham said, it is not my job to change Billy Graham. It's my job to pray for Billy Graham that God would change him. And so the Bible says be equally yoked. That means a believer marries a believer. Now why is that important? 
That's important because within the confines of that union of, of a man who's a Christian and a woman who's a Christian coming together as a husband and wife, they now have within them the, the grace of God, the peace of God, the mercy of God, the Spirit of God, and they're able to live together and walk together and work together with the blessing of God, but also there's going to come trouble and hardship and difficulty. Now, I asked this question in the early service, and you know, that's a younger group. How many of you remember the movie Love Story? Remember that? They told a lie in that movie. Huh? You're laughing, Paul. They told a lie in that movie. You know what they said? Love means never having to say, I'm sorry. Really, really, really. Is that right? There's many times I've had to say to my wife, I'm sorry. There are many times I wish she'd say to me, I'm sorry. <laughs> there are times I've said to my kids, I'm sorry. There are times when I wish they'd say to me, Dad, I'm sorry. You see, in the confines of marriage, because we love, we can extend grace, give grace, and give mercy. And there ought to be times when we recognize we've blown it and we've missed it. And we should be humble and be willing to say, I'm sorry I was wrong. Believers can do that because the virtues of Christ are in us. And that is the beginning step of making a strong, healthy family. And so it is in the confines of marriage as God created it. We begin to grow a family. God created the family. And God's desire is the family be strong and healthy. And it's only as strong and healthy as the members of that union are strong and healthy in their relationship with God. As a matter of fact, when you consider the bride of Christ, let's think about Jesus' bride. Let's think about the bride of Christ. How healthy is a bride of Christ? The bride of Christ is only as healthy as the members of the body of the bride of Christ are. That's you and me. And as we grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord and we keep and maintain a right relationship with Him, we have spiritual help to drift we apart from him, we, we hinder intimacy and intimate fellowship with him. We're not as healthy as we ought to be. And so we have to work toward health. So throughout history, families have always had conflict. Now if you say we don't ever have problems in our family, something's wrong. If you've never had a problem in your family, don't kid yourself. From the beginning of time, there's always been some degree and some measure of problems within families. There in Genesis, Adam and Eve. God created Adam from, from the dust of the ground. A Eve was created from a, a rib taken from his side. I saw a good picture the other day on Facebook. It was a picture of Adam and Eve. It was a pile of dirt on one side and a rib on the other. God created Adam and Eve. Now, did they have problems? Yeah, they had problems. Because Adam did not do what God had called him to do and assigned him to do. He was there with Eve when the serpent came and said, take the forbidden fruit. Take it. You can be like God. And Adam was passive and Adam was quiet and Adam didn't stand up in defense of his wife. And Adam didn't stand up to be the man and the head of his family. And Eve took the fruit and she batted those big eyelashes at Adam and he took the fruit. And they sinned against God. And we want to blame Eve. But God gave Adam the directive of what he should do with his wife and how he should leave his wife and what they should do in the garden and what they could take from and not take from. And Adam was there. The Bible says so. You read it. Adam was there. He was with his wife Eve. But he was quiet. He was passive. Now part of the problem today, and we're not going to say this about Eve, but part of the problem today is men are too passive in regard to leading their families and being the spiritual leaders in their home. Very passive. And sometimes men get passive because they have aggressive wives. Now that's true. I see some of you elbowing one another out there. Take it easy out there now. Well, we don't want any conflict. Well, listen, there's going to be some measure of conflict. But a man has to lead his home. And you've heard me say this. And we're all equal. Men and women. God created male and female. Both are equal in the sight of God. Both are equal. Both are important. Both are the same in the, in the confine as God sees them. 
But God gave a design and an order in creation. And he said that Eve was to be the head of his family. And I've said this many times. It's not original to me. I heard Adrian Rogers say it many, many years ago. He said anything with no head is what? Dead. And anything with two heads is what? A freak. There can only be one head. And God has given the responsibility of being the spiritual leader in the home and the leader of the home to the husband. Now I realize that there are many, many uh, places and many homes where their wives are wishing, I wish my husband would step up. And I've had him tell me that. I wish my husband would step up and be the head of our home. I wish my husband would step up and have prayer with our family. I wish our husband would step up and say, we're going to do this as it relates to the word of God. And so when husbands don't do that, wives take that responsibility. But it's a responsibility of the husband to lead his home and to lead his wife. But Adam and Eve had problems because Adam wouldn't step up. So they had problems. And uh, Adam and Eve had a son. Now we've all had trouble at one time or another raising children. You know how wonderful it is. You see these beautiful babies, beautiful babies they had up here. Weren't they precious? And that's a pretty little baby. And, and uh, you take that baby home, that baby's so precious. So wonderful. Brings so much joy. And slowly over the years, they get older and older and older and they reach adolescence. And oftentimes in adolescence, they think they know it all, don't they? And there's trouble. And there again, dad has to step up, mom has to step up. But Adam and Eve had trouble. Their first son, Cain, killed his brother Abel. Murder. They had trouble. Then you know the story of Adam and uh, Abraham and uh, Sarah. Uh, God had made a covenant with Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, of thee I'll make a great nation, your descendants shall be as the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky, and you will have, you will have a son, and he would have a son. They just had to wait on God, had to wait on the promises of God. They got tired of waiting. They got tired of waiting. And so Abraham and Sarah made a drastic mistake when Hagar became the third person in their marriage. And they had to survive the Hagar affair. But it created a lot of problems, a lot of strain. And as a result, my friend, the problem you see in the Middle East today is a direct result of that disobedience. You can trace it all the way back right there. That's where it started. You see, our sins have consequences that not only affect us, but affect other people and other generations in other parts of the world, perhaps. But they sinned. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. King David. Now, David was a man after God's own heart. He didn't have a perfect family. King David's family experienced adultery, deception, rape, and murder. And yet David was a man after God's own heart. He had problems. And sadly, conditions have not improved with the passage of time. No matter how dismal or hopeless our situation is, our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is in God. Our hope is in God's Word. And so today, I don't want you to be discouraged about any conflict or problem or anything going wrong in your family. God's able to resolve. God's able to help. We need to seek God's face and God's wisdom. The Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, God gives a design for the family. It is the prescription for a healthy family. But, but there's, a, there's a word that needs to be spoken and Barry mentioned it when he read the text. The prescription for a healthy family, first of all, begins with a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, a parent, maybe a single parent family, a dad, single parent family. Somewhere, somebody has to say, yes, I believe the Word of God. I believe the Word of God is true. I will live by the Word of God and I'll teach my children the Word of God. Now that's where it begins. And you and I as parents cannot teach our children or our grandchildren in a diligent fashion, and that's what the Bible says. The Bible says we are to teach our children diligently, with passion, with enthusiasm, in a believable manner, we're to teach them. To love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and with all their strength. And so it must be fleshed out in my life as a parent, in your life as a parent, in the lives of moms and dads and grandparents. We are to teach them. 
And now what are we to teach them? And this is what God said to Israel. He says, this is what you're to do. Hear, O Israel. This is the Shema. The Shema. The hearing. Hear this, Israel. Embrace this. Live this. Talk this. Sing this. Walk this. Flesh this out. Hear this, O Israel. The Lord our God is one. We do not serve a multiplicity of gods. We do not worship other gods. Thou shalt have no other god before me. The Lord our God, he is one. Now Israel would be going into a land flowing in milk and honey. And they would be encountering idols and other gods. And they were to constantly be reminded, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The Shema is the creed of Israel. They understood, I must love God with my total being, always. And I must teach my children to love God. And I will not embrace images and idols and serve other gods. For there's only one God, God Jehovah, and Him alone will I serve. And they understood Psalm 119.11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So here's what would happen. An orthodox or very devout Jew would constantly, being say, would constantly be saying the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You're to love Him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. They personalize it. I'm to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. Then they get really personal. Oh, Jehovah God, I love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. They were letting themselves know and speaking to themselves and speaking to their heart and speaking to their soul. That God alone is the one we worship and God alone is the one we love and God alone is the one we serve. And so mom and dad would do that. And they, they'd flesh that out before their kids. They'd flesh that out before their families. They'd teach it to their children. You see, the worship of idols and foreign gods was always a threat to Israel. It's a threat to us. Do people in the church serve idols? You better believe they do. Idolatry is still a problem in 2015. Anything that has a greater priority in our life and a greater devotion in our life than Jehovah God and our relationship with Jesus Christ has become an idol. And by the way, there cannot be spiritual awakening and revival in America until the church and the people of God destroy their idols. We can only serve Jehovah God. You look at it. Wherever there's been revival, it first comes that they destroy the idols. Wherever revival is, they destroy their idols. The church destroys their idols. That's what they did in Hosea 14. And so we, we have to say, Lord, we love you with all of our heart. We don't want to serve any other gods. We want to love you with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. Now, how do we know if we love God? How do we know if we love God? Well, Jesus was asked by a lawyer one time, what's the greatest commandment? He said, well, the greatest commandment is this. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second is likened to the first. You should love your neighbor as you love yourself. The way you know you love God is you love your neighbor. In the New Testament it says we know that we're the children of God because we love the brethren. We know that we're the children of God because we love the brethren. Now I know the Bible says we know that we're children of God because the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we're His children. I understand that. But the evidence and the fruit of us loving God and knowing that we know God and love God is that we love one another, that we love our neighbors, we love ourselves. The way we know we love God is we keep His commandments, we obey His Word, and we serve Him. And so He said to Israel, this is the way you build a strong, healthy family. The first step is, I am the only one. The Lord your God is one and only me, only me, only me, God's saying, only me. So love me with complete devotion. Then he gave him another one, second one. He said, in this thing of bringing, building a strong and healthy family, you are commanded to teach your children the word of God. And then he begins to list 
You teach them along the way. You teach them when you get up. You teach them when you sit down. You teach them constantly. You teach them. You have scripture here, scripture there. You are right within the frontless of your eyes. You're always exposing them to the Word of God and the truth of the Word of God. Now, how would you do that today? Let's just give me an example. If you have a Bible app on your phone, you can send your scripture every day, send your children scripture every day of the week. Make it personal. You can send them scripture. You can make sure they have scripture every day of the week. Send it to them. Send it because you know they're going to look at the phone. I was involved in a family day yesterday and we were celebrating birthdays and those kind of things and we decided to play a family game. There was a question asked on average, how many texts does a child send every day? Text message. You ready for this? On average, a child will send 200 texts every day. At least 200. Now, sometimes that happens in school. They're not supposed to have a phone at school. But at least 200. At least 200 every day. That's a lot of texting. And the dangerous thing about it is when they're doing it when they drive, you're not supposed to do that. So listen, they're into this technology. Send them scripture. Send them the word of God. Send them the word. And so you've got to give them the word of God. You've got to teach them the word of God. Now here's what we need to know. It says that in this passage, where does Christian education begin? At home. It doesn't begin. It doesn't begin at church. It doesn't begin in the school. Christian education begins at home. It is not the responsibility of the school to do that. It's not, it's not the responsibility of the community to do that. It begins at home. Now, here's the thing. Somebody says, well, I've taken prayer out of school. I understand what you're saying, but you know, any child can pray anytime they want to at school. Nobody can keep them from praying. They can pray anytime they want to pray. But here's the thing that rubs me. Some of these say, well, they've taken the prayer out of school, and those very people haven't taken time to pray with their kids at home. If we were praying with our kids at home, constantly leading them, guiding them, directing them spiritually, they'd have the foundation they need to stand strong and be, and be strong in the Lord if we were leading at home. So it begins at home, Christian education. We have our responsibility as a church to lead in Christian education. But we pray at home. Now here's what it says. We, we are to teach them and we're to teach them diligently. The idea here is it is so much a part of our lives as a parent that it flows through our very pores. Now until it is a part of our lives to such a degree that it flows through our pores, it is not believable on the part of a child. A child knows if we're dedicated to the Lord or not. A child knows if we love the Lord or not. A child knows if our devotion to the Lord is greater than our devotion to something else. You can't fool children. Children know. And so if we're going to make an indelible impression upon the lives of our kids, we must live it. We must walk it. We must teach them diligently. And we look for teaching moments. And I've learned along the way. My kids have grown up now, and I made some mistakes trying to teach them. You know, three points in a poem won't work. You look for teaching moments to teach them, to talk about a scripture, to teach the value of a text. Look for teaching moments, but we're to teach them, and we're to pray, and we're to teach them diligently. And mom and dad can't do that until they do it themselves, themselves. It is to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all our mind, and all our strength. But here's the thing. Our mediocrity. Our mediocrity. Our passiveness. Our being passive. About the things of God. The spiritual things of God. Have compelled a generation. To look in other places. To find life and purpose. And hope. Our passiveness. Our mediocrity. Has called a generation to look other places. There's a generation now, the, the, uh, the millennials, 4% or less than 4% believe. And so the next great generation coming behind us, 96, let's say 95% don't know God. 
They're going to be the, they're going to be the leaders. They're going to be the leaders. They're going to be the bankers, the lawyers. They're going to be the president, the governors, the senators, the doctors. And they give no knowledge of our, our, our acknowledgement of God. Does this look like anything to you? Tell you what it looks like to me. It looks like Europe. Do you know where we're headed unless there's a spiritual renewal in this country? We're headed. We're going to look like Europe. Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached in a humongous church. And every Sunday when to preach, he'd preach to the masses. He'd preach. People couldn't get in. They tried again then. They couldn't get in. The church couldn't handle all the people. You can go to Europe. You can go to London. You go to anywhere in Europe. And the churches that once were packed to capacity are now empty. Why? Why has a generation come about that don't know God? Well, you read about it in Judges chapter 2. Because... There, there came a t- point in time when families stopped talking about God. Families stopped serving God. Families stopped teaching their children about God. Families stopped recollecting the intervention, the miracles of God in their own life. Families stopped teaching and training and leading their children in a spiritual manner. It says in Judges 2, a generation came about that did not know God. That's where we are, church. Now, is there hope? Yes, there's hope. There's nothing impossible with God. But we must do the right thing as mothers and fathers and husbands and wives. We must teach our children. So how are we going to do that? We're going to flesh it out as parents. We're going to be good listeners to our children and our grandchildren. You know why some children stay in trouble and get in trouble? Because they've come to understand the only time I have my parents' undivided attention is when I act up, mess up, misbehave, and then they'll listen. And it's painful for me if I get disciplined, but it's, it's, about, the, it's about the only time I can get their attention. And that's true. We have to be good listeners. And we have to discipline our children without rejection. Sometimes we discipline our children, and the manner we discipline our children, they feel like we've rejected them. We should never discipline our children in anger. We need to have a time out ourselves to calm down and get right and understand why we're doing what we're doing. Not just because we're mad, because right and wrong. But when we exercise whatever kind of discipline it was that we use, we don't do it in a manner where they feel rejected. We love them. And, and, and we're loving them and we're loving one another. And then as parents, we can't pay favorites. Did anybody in the Bible pay, fra- pay favorites? Yeah. There was a guy that had a coat of many colors. And a daddy played favorites, and he turned all of his kids against this child they played favorites with. You can't play favorites as parents. You've got to love all your children equally, equally, equally. We have to do that. And in and, and, and teaching and training our children, husbands and wives are to teach their children how to love one another. And they're to teaching, mom and dad are teaching their children how a man to love a woman, how a woman to love a man, how a husband loves a wife, how the wife loves a husband. I try to model that for my Children, my family. Uh, one of the most precious things I received was a note from my daughter-in-law about a year or so ago. And she says, thank you for teaching Matt, her husband, my son, how to love me by him watching you how you loved Deborah. Now, I want to tell you, that's treasure. How, how does a little girl know how a man's supposed to love her when she gets married? She's watching daddy, how daddy loves mama. And, and how, how is a, a guy, a son, supposed to know how to love his wife? He, he's watching dad, how he loves his mother. And, and, and back and forth. Watching mom love dad. You see, we model family. We model marriage. We model parenting. All of this is modeled in the life of our family. And then, I mentioned before, you know, we have to say, I'm sorry, we have to say, I'm wrong, we mess up, and be real and be transparent. But the biggest thing we need to do to have strong and healthy families in our, in our nation and in our country is we have to get back to prayer. We have to get back to prayer. The Bible says, if two agree... Now, if you've got a husband and a wife, how many you got? How many? Two. Hey, that works. 
if two agree. Husband, wife, man, you got the makings for a powerful prayer, prayer partnership relationship. But here's the thing. And nobody's going to get beat up today, so listen. Let's just be honest. We, we husbands and wives are not praying together and praying with each other and for each other like we ought to. It's a very awkward thing for a man to say to his wife, I want to pray for you, honey. I want to pray with you. It's really kind of awkward. And yet we need to do that. Even if we don't start out except let's just pray silently. You take a hand, you pray. Many, many weeks ago, I had a Wednesday night group meeting. We were doing this study on stepping up. And I related to them about my experience going to a prayer conference. Uh, our husband and wife retreat. Henry Blackaby was leading it, one of the leaders. And it was just for ministers, staff, wife, staff and their wives. And he started talking about us praying together. And there was a lot, you could feel the conviction in the room because, you know, just because you're preachers and pastors don't mean you're super spiritual and do everything you ought to do. And he said, you know, probably in this room, very few of the women here have their husbands pray with them. And the women were nodding. And then he turned in a moment and said, and in this room, very few of you wives have said to your husbands who is in ministry, let me pray for you and the men. So it was both ways. And so he said, I want, I want you men to put the your head in your wife's laps and ladies I want you to put your hands on their head and I want you to pray for them well it's kind of awkward moment for some but then they started praying and you could hear sobbing and weeping all over that place we were gathered and for the first time for some and the first time in a long time for others there was an intimate moment of prayer and then he said, all right, we're going to change over. And I, I want it to flip over. Ladies, I want you to put your head in the laps of your husbands. And I want you to, men to put your hands on their heads and pray for them. Just pray for your wife. And those men started calling out the names of wife. And boy, you could hear it <gasps> all over that place. That was unbelievable. It was a high and holy spiritual moment. And he got up and ladies' makeup all over their faces. I mean, the makeup had run everywhere. And that is the place where the battles are fought for family. That is the place where the battle is fought for your children. That is the place where the battle is fought for your marriage and for your needs. Hand in hand, face to face, toe to toe, praying. Praying. And so we need to pray to have strong families. I shared this in the early service. I know I've shared it before, but it came home to me in a new way as a child because I would pray with our kids. I'd pray. We prayed as a family. I'd pray with the kids. And, you know, we didn't pray every, every day before they go to school. Most days I tried to pray with them before they go to school. And, uh, and we'd pray certainly sometime during the day, but I, I tried to get in the habit of praying with them before they go to school. And so uh, Matt and I were standing in the doorway waiting for the cheese wagon. Y'all know what that is, don't you? That's the bus. And we'd stand there waiting for the bus. And I, I, I'd hold his hand and we'd pray for a good day. We'd pray, pray, pray. He'd go to school. And we'd do that, you know, about every day we'd pray. Maybe we'd hear, we, but anyway, one day we'd run late behind and he ran, Dad, I'm gone. He ran out and got on the bus. Well, I got a phone call from school. I said, Mr. O'Quinn, you need to come. There's been an accident. I, I think it's okay, but Matt's been injured. You need to come. He's playing ball, and a ball hit him on the end of his finger, shattered his finger. I had to take him to see an orthopedic. And uh, as we were going, he was hurting, and Abe's kind of badged up. He said, this is your fault. <laughs> I said, I didn't throw the ball. He said, you didn't pray with me this morning. Man, you talk about a dagger. You didn't pray with me this morning. He was in the early service, and he let everybody know. He showed him the finger, which one it was. I won't show you which one it was, but anyway. <laughs> it's still kind of big on the end where it shattered it. Here's the mark. Here's the mark. We didn't pray. Now, I don't know if we had prayed. That not happened. 
But in his mind, he thought, because we pray, something bad happened to him when we didn't pray. I want to tell you, if we want to have strong, healthy families, we have to pray. The only hope for America is God. I was sitting where Chuck was sitting last Sunday night. And I watched 68 or 69 children, four-year-olds, stand on this platform. They graduated from our weekday preschool, which is the best preschool in Henry County, by the way. Yeah, you go ahead and do that. Anyway, I watched them stand up here. And they flashed on that board, that screen. This is the class of 2028. And then I got deeply convicted. Oh God, what will the world look like for them? What's the world going to look like? What's America? If America is Stephen here, what are they looking at? What are they facing? They're so young. The class of 2028. And as much as we want to love them, we can't protect them all the days. So we can't go with them everywhere they go. All we can do is pray. 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 So let's do our part as best we can with the Spirit of God to grow strong, healthy families. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we know we need your help. We can't do anything without you. We're desperate for you, Lord. As a deer pants for the water's brook, so our soul thirsts for you, O oh God. And Lord, our hearts hurt for families for children, for adolescents, for marriages, for relationships. We pray for healing in homes and healings in families and healing in relationships between parent and child. We pray, Lord, that, that you'd help us. This is bigger than us. We need your help. And so, Lord, help us as much as we're able as believers to live out your word and to flesh out your truth in the eyes of our children, our grandchildren, the children of our community. And Lord, we release them to you because they're yours. I pray you bless the families of this church called Bethany. And we know, Lord, that strong families here make for a strong church. And so, Lord, help us to be obedient. Help us to renew and recommit ourselves to live out your word and flesh out your word. And it may be that our children have grown up and they're no longer home, but there, maybe there's grandchildren. Or they're the kids' children or somebody else's children that we can have an influence in. Lord, help us to do our part to teach the children, train the children, to be an example and to build strong families. We commit this time to you that we be obedient and honor the prompting of your spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed the message today and the time of worship. And I pray that you sense the Lord's presence right there where you are in your own home or in a hotel room or wherever you're watching the service today. We hope that uh, you sense the presence of the Lord. And hope you'll be faithful to tune in every Sunday on this channel at this time to watch the broadcast. I want you to know that Bethany Baptist Church is located at the corner of Highway 81 and uh, Bethany Road. And we encourage you to come and uh, visit with us. If you have prayer concerns, please call us at uh, our church number 770-957-4455 or you can email us at uh, www.4nbethany.org and uh, we'll be glad to hear from you, take your prayer requests and I assure you that we will pray over your needs. So thank you for joining us and look forward to uh, you being with us again next Sunday. God bless you.